Hello, I'm Dr. Julia Overstreet. I'm a podiatrist who was in practice over 25 years near Seattle, Washington. My specialties are high risk foot care, diabetic foot care, and lower extremity wound care. This program is one in a series that I prepared in helping me train uh, nurses to provide foot care for our seniors. It is uh, specifically on toenail clipping fundamentals. It's a primer for our hands-on class in Issaquah, Washington. We hold it every month. For more information on that, you can go to our website. Today's program, we're going to cover a number of issues. Number one, I'm going to introduce you to different instruments that are used professionally for clipping nails. We're going to go over achieving safe and thorough debridement. And after this uh, PowerPoint, we will be showing videos that were taken in our hands-on class uh, each month, and that will demonstrate some of the methods that we're showing. The entire program is a little less than two hours long. Please remember that this instructional program is designed for nurses who are training to provide medically appropriate routine foot care to their patients and clients. Do not attempt these techniques if you are not a trained healthcare provider. Nurses should not practice these techniques without further mentoring, training, and practice. For nurses wishing further information on educational programs and hands-on foot care training, go to one of our websites, rainiermed.com, nursingfootcare.com, and afcna.org. That's our American Foot Care Nurses Association site. There are a number of different types of clippers that we use in professional nail care. You'll notice that none of these are the little ones that we've seen used on babies and, and children that you use with your thumb. That's not something that's appropriate for our purposes. It doesn't matter which of these types of clippers you use. Whatever you learn with, you will become good with. That's just the nature of these kind of skills. There are different uh, uh, types of, of heads to them. You have the, the moon clipper that's shaped kind of in a C shape. You have uh, just the more traditional kind of clipper. And some of them are very pointed like this. As I said, it doesn't really matter what you use. Uh, the other thing to point out, this is what they call a double action clipper. It has two different hinges. So I wanted to mention that in case you've heard of it. It's actually a bone cutter that we use in surgery. It, the two different hinges give us mechanical advantage. You'll see that I don't teach uh, cutting thicker toenails uh, with this. We want to sand them if possible. But this is something that you may have heard of and can have utility uh, for someone who can't use a sander for other reasons and needs to have something that might help with the thicker nails. So once again, it doesn't matter which of these you learn with, you'll get good with it. This is another instrument that I use frequently, all podiatrists do. It's a dermal curette. It's not the type of curette that is scalpel sharp. This is a dermal curette. Uh, they have um, a, sort of a cup or, or a scoop on each side. And as such, just like an ice cream scoop, one side is rounded and one side, the top side that you would you know, dip into the ice cream, is a little bit, um, I'll use the word sharper, but it's not scalpel sharp. The one that is perfect for what we do is a double-ended curette. It has a 2.5 millimeter cup on one side and a 3.5 millimeter cup on the other side. That allows you some options to get into tighter spaces. As you can see here, I'm scraping along the sides of the nail. I'm kind of exploring with this. You'll be shown how to use it, but realize the patients do not like this. It's very pokey. Don't overuse the curette. It is something that I use sparingly and for just one or two seconds to, if I need to find something out or if I need to make sure that I've gotten all the way to the edge of the nail and not left a spicule. And if that doesn't make sense to you, it will by the time we're done. So this is not something you use a lot. It's something that um, we use toward the end of care to make sure we've gotten all of the um, spots out that we need. By the way, one thing you're not seeing here is one of those little wooden sticks that they use, an orange stick it's called. We are not pedicurists. 
it's great that they use them. We're medical professionals. We do not use orange sticks. It has absolutely no value in what we do. We don't push back the cuticle, for instance, on the toes, especially in our seniors. Most of the time, the, the cuticles aren't really visible anyway in, in the senior feet, but they are protective. It keeps debris and other things from getting back under the skin in the matrix area. We want to leave that alone. The, the, uh, the uh, cuticle there serves a purpose. The orange stick does not. We can't explore things with it. We're not using it to get anything out from under the, the distal edge of the nail. We don't even use the curette for that. That also is painful, time consuming, and not necessary because as you're going to see, we take off the entire distal aspect of the toenail. We make it as short as possible. So there's no reason to spend any time getting debris out from under the distal tip of the nail. It's going to just fall off as we cut the nail. Another type of instrument that's commonly used, especially uh, with Canadian foot care nurses, they're absolutely fabulous. They've been doing this uh, many years longer than the US foot care nurses have been uh, able to provide this care. It, they're called Blax files, and they come in all different shapes and sizes. They're basically different kinds of, of rasps. Some are, uh, are fine, some are a little coarser, some are bent, and they use them in kind of the same way. They kind of put them along uh, the side of the nail a little bit to explore, but they will use it to thin that side of the nail. Uh, it's a very effective tool for that. As a podiatrist in the States, I wasn't trained with the Black's files. I was trained with the curette, so my training for you will involve the curette. But please feel free to, to branch out and use some of the Black's files uh, in those nail borders. They work fantastic. And uh, as I said, uh, uh, the Canadian foot care nurses use them almost exclusively with really good results. So today in our hands-on class, you're going to be using mostly these two instruments, the ba what I call the basic nipper and that curette. It doesn't matter what you use in the long run, you will get good with it. The techniques I'm gonna show you on this video can be accomplished with any of those kinds of clippers. This is just the basic nipper that most podiatrists train with. I've been using it for 26 years, it's what I'm the best with. Uh, it's very versatile, it never needs to be sharpened, and, and let me talk about that for just a second. In the U.S., we can use what's called floor-grade uh, stainless steel, so you know, like in the hospital floor as opposed to in the operating room. In Canada, most of the provinces need to use high-grade surgical stainless steel, the, uh, the operating room grade. The difference is that high-grade steel um, it, from Germany is more is softer. They can get a better um, cutting edge with it, which we need in surgery, but since it's softer, it dulls very quickly. Uh, the Canadian foot care nurses uh, will frequently need to get their um, clippers and, and devices sharpened. That's, a, that's an important part of their care. In the States, since we can use the less expensive grade, more the Pakistani or Chinese stainless steel, Perfectly acceptable in hospitals, but on the floor, uh, the nursing floors, for instance, and in clinic, as opposed to the OR. They, um, they all uh, disinfect and sterilize just the same. None of that's different. The uh, advantage to us being able to use that floor grade or the, frankly, cheaper grade of stainless steel is that it's harder. It doesn't dull. So we would never have to sharpen any of our instruments uh, made of the, the lower grade stainless steel. Perfectly medically appropriate uh, uh, instruments, but they're harder. In, in my career of 26 years, I have never sharpened an instrument. Sometimes I have to throw them away. Frankly, the hinges and the springs, you know, after a few years just don't work well anymore, but I've never had to sharpen one. If you th use the, uh, the uh, lower grade st uh, stainless steel instruments that we mostly have here in the States and you think you need to sharpen it, that means you're taking too big a bite. It's not meant to do that and that's one of the things we're going to learn in this is how to use these instruments appropriately. Let's go into some of the techniques now that we've talked about the different instruments that uh, are commonly used. Are the methods that we're using effective? Are they definitive care? Is it gonna take care of the problem? And is it medically appropriate? 
you are uh, nurses and we need to keep all of these things in mind. Uh, as I said before, we're not pedicurists. I'm not against pedicurists. I have pedicures myself, but we are providing medical grade nursing foot care. When you're looking at these three, effective methods, definitive care and medically appropriate, and you look around to some of the methods that are being used even by medical professionals, it actually is um, shocking. For instance, this is actually in medical textbooks, in nursing books. I've seen it in, in fairly current ones. Uh, I've seen it in instructional videos, putting a, uh, the, the, the stick of a swab under the ingrown nail. Okay, uh, putting a piece of cotton under the ingrown nail. Now I can see, I put this red arrow up, that nail was digging into the skin there. Absolutely it was. And you have to do something about it. Are these methods effective and definitive? They, they might be effective in the short run for a day or two. Are they definitive? No. Who is going to keep a wooden stick under their nail? What happens when that piece of cotton gets flat or falls out? Are you, is someone going to go and replace that on a daily or, or, or every few days basis? It is not definitive care. Is it medically appropriate care? I know that I said it's in textbooks, but it is not medically appropriate care. I can envision this back in Little House on the Prairie days, not in this age. What about if for definitive medically appropriate care, we trimmed that nail and maybe that side too. That would take, I don't know, 10 seconds and be definitive and medically appropriate. It would last for several months and take care of the problem. The issue is people are afraid of toenails. They're afraid of clippers. For generations, we've been told don't touch clippers uh, on, on diabetic feet and that sort of thing. Luckily now we understand it's much less risky to actually treat it appropriately than to do something like these two show. So please um, help me get rid of these as considered medically appropriate. These are also, uh, if you Google uh, this kind of thing, different kinds of braces that are used uh, to, to uncurl nails, the, the omega nails, the curled nails, or the frequently ingrown nails because they're too wide. Um, during my training in San Francisco in the, in the late 80s, I worked with a podiatrist, a wonderful podiatrist from Australia. Um, they've worked with this for a very long time and they are not surgical uh, podiatrists the way we are here. They had to come up with other methods to help their patients. They're not able to do ingrown toenails surgery, matricectomies. So they've been using these kind of things uh, back for, for decades and she showed me some of the things they do. The ones she showed were more like in the bottom right there with things that looked like what you would put on braces on teeth. They sort of glue the wire on uh, indefinitely and train the nail to not be so rounded. It's what they had to do. They couldn't do anything else. Uh, and for them, over a long period of time, um, I assume they got good results. I was never able to witness that. It's not something that we need to do here. Let's take care of this medically inappropriate. Even our nurses here have the scope of practice to do definitive care. Perhaps not matricectomies, but to do significant debridement of the nail to make them safer for months at a time. And by the way, I love that one on the bottom left. It, it, it's supposed to, it, you can see how high that is. It's two or three inches high. I don't know if they're supposed to wear shoes with that or just wear it in bed. I'm not sure what they're supposed to do with that. Interesting. Let's just learn to trip, trim them, huh? Here we go. This one is my favorite. And the minute I put the picture up, you'll know what I'm talking about. We've all seen or heard of it. The V. Please cut a V in my nail so it won't get ingrown. Again, I saw in a medical nursing textbook uh, a few months ago, a relatively current book. Oh my goodness. Again, I can picture Little House on the Prairie maybe, but not today. Think how far back you would have to cut that V in order for the distal edges to be able to kind of grow more toward the middle. Even this picture looks like it caused bleeding when they did it. And that nail is still so hard, it's, it's difficult 
in my mind to believe that those edges are going to kind of go that grow more that way and that way I don't see that happening it is a wives tale it's brutal uh, I'm certainly not going to make the patient bleed um, but it's something we see all the time and it's still in textbooks uh, I want to digress just a minute to tell you my personal um, my personal approach to this because I've certainly been asked to do this my entire career and, and when I was a new podiatrist of course I was I'm going to educate the patients I'm going to let them know and and I'm going to show them the light that never worked they would just stare at me as I was trying to explain the physics of how far back I'd have to cut and very early in my career what I learned was when someone came in for this kind of care and they wanted the V in their in their big toenail it's usually the, the great toenail I said absolutely so the first thing I would do is I would cut a V not back as far as in this picture but just back as far as the white part was so I wasn't creating any bleeding I was just creating a V in that white part and I then I have them look at it and I say how's that and they say a little bit bigger so I'd maybe do you know a little bit more like that but I wouldn't go back into where it might bleed it was still in that in that white portion okay that'll be fine then I would go on to different toes and we'd start talking and I about you know some other point during the care I would just cut the entire thing off because I was going to do that anyway I always take almost all of that distal white off and because I want to buy them a lot of time before they have to come in again in, in effect then I'm also cutting off that little V I just made because I only put it in that distal white area I was never questioned about it they would come back the next time in two or three months and say see I told you you cut that V and I didn't have any ingrowns and I'll go absolutely you're right so that's my little podiatry joke you know when you work with feet all day you have to have a sense of humor and that was the way I dealt with that because I was never able to convince people that it didn't work okay ingrown nails there are two types basically of ingrown nails the one on the left there is on the, the nail folds the sides of the nail both lateral and medial and on the right it's showing in the distal uh, area of that nail okay two different types so the one on the left you can kind of see the pus there um, especially right here a little pocket of pus and a little bit up here that you can see uh, and on this other one the little pus pocket is and the distal tip there there isn't always pus under there but that's that yellow with greenish with the intact skin that's pus under there in the distal area let's discuss these two different types of ingrown nails because uh, it makes a big difference in how we treat them so type number one and, and it's not really type number one I'm just listing it first <clears throat> is something uh, on the distal tip there it's from improper cutting we have created that that is not something done in nature what has happened is when you see the pus pocket there distally they're on the medial excuse me the lateral uh, distal area when the last person cut this nail which is very wide they cut it down but they didn't go all the way to the edge of the nail see how far out that edge is way under the skin it's shocking sometimes uh, and I'll show you pictures of matricectomies later how much that side of the nail goes down where we can't see it so one of the most important things we have to learn in our techniques for nail cutting is how to get all the way to the edge of the nail not to leave that little spike there one of the things we use a curette for is to kind of feel down there where we can't see and feel for the spike because you can feel it you just have to know if you are going to round down the nails which is what I'm going to teach you that's what podiatrists do you have to know that for this type of nail that is wider where you can't see the edge of it you have to make sure you've gone all the way to the edge that's the only trick and that's something that, that we can learn go all the way to the nail border even if it's under the skin when you're doing each cut now of course I know that a lot of you are thinking well but why are we going to trim it down the side like that shouldn't we just cut it straight across and leave those borders up absolutely if you are not trained the way we're going to train you um, you should just cut a nail straight across where the borders on each distal area show that way it can't get ingrown in this fashion 
you'll see them in a minute. It doesn't help the other type of ingrown nail. Uh, but that's why we are being trained to, tri as podiatrists are, to trim it down slightly on the side. Uh, you'll see the advantages and techniques for that uh, a little bit later today. You have to, though, be aware of that uh, problem, problem with it. The ingrown nail on type number two um, is a wide nail plate. Some people are born with wide nails and this sort of thing happens early in life where they, they have constant ingrown nails on the sides. Others, it happens as you age. Uh, for reasons no one quite understands, nail plates can get wider as part of normal aging. I've seen that start um, in, the, in the 60s, which uh, <clears throat> is way too young as far as I'm concerned with anything aging, but it, it could be that they never had anything earlier in life, but now as part of aging, their nail is becoming wider or the periungual uh, skin, the t skin around the nail uh, is a little more swollen or some combination of that. So what, for whatever cause at this angle, at this point in their lives, their nail plates are too wide and it cuts in as it grows out. It's like a knife, it lacerates. There's another image where it's not the entire nail because that nail of course isn't as long uh, as the one on top of it or on the other one. The nail is wide and uh, particularly when it's a thin nail like this, we don't have so much problem when it's a thick mycotic or dystrophic nail. It can't lacerate in. But these thin nails that we think are really good, they are actually very thin. And so they literally lacerate into that skin. And any kind of laceration on the foot, the foot and the mouth, by nature are what are called dirty fields. There's no way to sterilize or, or really clean the mouth or the foot. There's just too many nooks and crannies, too many bugs. So even a really clean person, when they lacerate the skin like that, the bacteria just pour in and you get the pus and an infection. Okay, you can see there in the nail groove, uh, the lateral and medial nail grooves. The nail plate is cutting into one or both sides. Perinichia is the fancy word for swollen red ed, in, uh, side of a nail or any portion of a, of a toe next to a nail. It's perinichia. That's a word for your charting. It um, doesn't have to be the same as ingrown. Ingrown is a word that's overused. That, in my mind, implies that it's, it's actually cutting in and infected and in a more advanced situation. This particular picture is a more advanced situation, but perinichia can just be some minor redness along the side of the, of the nail on the skin. That's still perinichia. Now, interestingly, on this picture, they tried to cut this nail uh, with that leading edge up higher so it wouldn't get ingrown. You can see how it kind of heads off uh, laterally like that. It doesn't go straight across. If they had been cutting it straight across, it would go more like that. But this had clearly been an ongoing uh, problem. This is not my patient. This was a, a picture from a textbook. Uh, but this clearly had been a problem. They were trying to address it by not letting that edge get ingrown, uh, by leaving it more distal. Reason I'm telling you about the two different kinds of nails is you can see that didn't help. This is massively uh, involved at this point, despite the fact that that distal edge isn't caught anywhere. That distal edge would create the other type of ingrown. This is a wide nail. It's cutting in. That erythema goes the entire length uh, of that nail plate. It goes from distal to proximal. That's not just in the distal area. It doesn't matter how they cut that nail. It is wide, it is a thin nail, so it is sharp, and it is cutting in constantly. No amount of antibiotics is going to help this because that nail is cutting in and bacteria pour in and in and in. Soaking is about the worst thing you could do. Uh, that probably introduces more germs than anything and washes them right into the laceration. This is a cut, it's a laceration you have to take out the knife, so to speak. And that's the kind of thing that we're gonna learn. When this happens on a consistent basis, as this one apparently did, avulsion or matricectomy would be um, the, the course to take. 
advanced practice nurses in the US are certainly able to do this. Otherwise, podiatry or some dermatologists will do this. Um, it's a fairly simple procedure, but there are some um, pitfalls to it from their point of view, and, and that's a different class, so we won't discuss that. But avulsion is where they numb up the toe, and by the way, numbing it up is lidocaine back injection there and there. It's a, uh, it's a uh, digit block. Sometimes, especially in little um, neighborhood clinics, and dock in the box, they will inject the lidocaine up in the most painful part. Not appropriate. It needs to be done, the injection for lidocaine back here. The nerves are back here, and that will numb the entire toe. So it needs to be injected to numb it, and then with an avulsion, they take the side of the nail off, and that's the end of it. They just treat it locally uh, for the infection. With a matricectomy, they would take that piece of nail off, and then um, not now because it's infected, but in a few days they might treat it with an acid to kill that side of the uh, root so that nail is permanently less wide. So avulsion, that nail will grow back. A matricectomy, whatever portion they treat will not grow back. So with a partial matricectomy, they would just take part of the nail out, whether it's or partial avulsion, just part of it. You can do the total nail too, but most people don't need that. They just need the offending nail border out. I said I'd show you how big these pieces are. That's, it's huge, the piece that comes out. That's, uh, to this day I'm shocked when I pull them out. You just can't tell how big that piece is. But this was the piece taken out of there and you can kind of see on this one that little spike there that might have caused the problem for that particular one. That's not the same toe as you can tell. Again, no antibiotics are necessary if the ingrown portion of the nail can be removed. Local care will be enough after removal of the lacerating portion of the nail. So sometimes like this one, it's more advanced, we may not need, we, excuse me, we may, may need to refer it on for someone else to do a, a larger procedure. But as foot care nurses, you are allowed to do the trimming on this uh, where you could have actually taken this part of the nail off with just the trimmer, just your clipper. Now, is that gonna hurt? Yes, and we're gonna discuss that. But it is within scope of practice to just cut that piece off. And at that point, antibiotics aren't necessary, just local care. When you're working on your patients and clients, I want you to be aware of what you're seeing. You know, you're going to be doing a little physical exam, and then we've discussed that on other videos. But this is about the nail itself, excuse me, the toe itself. I want you to look at these pictures before I start marking them up and look for problem areas. These are things that are going to warn you where you need to take more care. So they're not actually in, in, ingrowns or infected, but this is perinicchia, little swollen areas where there's a little bit of localized swelling, a little bit of localized redness. That tells me something's wrong under there. So on that first one, you can look right there. Very uh, discreet, very, very confined, little swelling and redness. So although I can see the side of the nail here, it's possible that down here something was left uh, the last time that was cut. On this one, you can see it on the distal edge there. It's more swollen and little red. So it might be one of those distal, uh, distal lesions again. Again, that you have to get used to looking at this. Otherwise, you're going to look right past it. But look how much redder and swollen that is than the tissue around it. That tells us there's an ongoing problem there, and every time we clip that nail, we need to take extra care in that, in that little spot. And again here on this side. So get used to looking at the nail for these little uh, pressure, excuse me, these warning signs. Your nail cutting goals. Isn't that gorgeous? That's like my life. That is gorgeous. Okay, sorry. Uh, nail cutting goals. First, remove any ingrowing nail areas. Uh, maybe the patient or the client reported pain. Maybe your visual inspection showed, well, the last slide showed a little bit of swelling, a little bit of erythema. Even if it's not actually ingrown with a problem, um, you're gonna do that visual inspection. So definitely have to work on any areas that are problems. Shorten the nails. I do it relatively short. Uh, I take most of the white portion off. 
unless the patient or client asks me not to. If they want it a little bit longer, I absolutely do respect that. But if they don't care, I take them as short as I can, like you see in this picture. They can't come back for at least two months, maybe three. And I want that nail to be uh, safe as long as possible. That's my, my reason. I'm not worried about the way it looks. Uh, like I said, if they are, I will work with them on that. I care about it medically and I want it as short as possible. There's no reason to leave any of that white portion on. Sand or remove areas of crumbled or dystrophic nails. Uh, areas that, and we'll see pictures of all of this, we're dealing not with so much pictures like you see here, but more crumbly nails. And if we leave that crumbly stuff on, it's going to continue to crumble and scratch, even if it's not today. And I'll show you pictures of all of this. Gently round the nail borders to prevent ingrown or scratching during regrowth. Uh, we talked about going all the way to the edge of the nail to prevent regrowth. The other reason is that we don't want it to either rub uh, or, or kind of poke into the nail next to it as, excuse me, the toe next to it as it's growing in. Uh, or they sometimes in bed, they'll, you know, you move your legs around in bed. I've seen people scratch their legs with nails that, um, that aren't appropriately rounded. Also creating, avoid creating U-shaped distal edges. That does, I know you don't know what that is right now, but that's what we're going to cover. And that also during regrowth will cause problems. So don't worry about that right now. We'll cover what that is. Anticipate how the nails will grow out over the next few weeks. It, it can be beautiful today and I'll rub my finger over it from different uh, areas and, and I'm not feeling any sharp spots or anything. But how will that nail grow out over the next couple of weeks, much less the next couple of months? You have to sort of predict what's going to happen. And we've kind of already discussed that. You know, we have to remove that crumbled dystrophic nail for later. We have to not leave spikes or that U-shape. Again, that all has to do with uh, anticipating how it's going to grow and doing a little more than you might think you need to do today so that you prevent any problems as that nail grows out. And finally, view it from the patient's angle. Ask them toward the end if, if you got everything the way they want it because they have pretty clear uh, ideas of what they want and make it, make it comfortable for them to say, you know, I'd really like it if you did this or did that a little bit more. If you didn't do this other thing next time, ask them. But also, um, and we'll see pictures of this, you're looking at it from the distal end. And if you just bend the toes down a little bit, so you see it from the top, from the patient's view, you might see that you didn't cut it straight across, that you left sort of a funny shape to the edge of the nail or something like that. So always look at it from different viewpoints before you say everything is finished. And we'll look at examples of all of this. Different ways to, uh, to cut the nail, rounded a little bit, rounded more, uh, doesn't have to be that short. You know, every toenail in the world literally is different. So don't worry too much about it. We're gonna go into what's safe and what's effective. Making sure to realize that that nail is actually much wider than the area that we're seeing. Gotta prevent those spikes. This was four and after pictures. Uh, I want them relatively short. I want to um, that patient to be able to go as, as long as possible without it catching on their support socks. Uh, let's, let's not have them wreck a hundred dollar pair of support socks or hit their shoes, cause infection, anything at all. So I like these as short as possible unless the patient requests a little different and then we'll, we'll work at that. We looked at these kind of pictures, didn't we? Remove any ingrowing nail, either that the patient reported pain or that you're seeing those little areas. And I'm hoping that now you look at those. Remember that? So on this one, you're gonna cut that down on the left picture there, down a little bit further and all the way out to the edge. Cause remember we suspected there was a, a little um, spike about halfway down that someone had left. On this one, that's also just cutting. Now, yes, you're going to be cutting under where you can't see, but that's one of the skills that we're going to learn in the hands-on class. Very easy to do, doesn't hurt them, scary for you, but it's, it's, it's something that we need to, to do. That's the whole purpose for our care. If you could see it like you can here, you would see that the edge of the nail clippers would go past 
the edge, I can't draw that, past the edge of the nail. And that's the way we know that we've gotten all of it. That's great in a picture like this where you can see the edge of the nail, but on those other two pictures, you have to do it by feel and then perhaps check it with the curette. Those are techniques we're gonna learn. Shortening the nails, again, relatively short um, and move it, move the toes down so you can observe it from the patient's viewing angle. All three of these actually didn't catch when I, when I, you know, kind of uh, went over them with my finger to see if the socks would catch. Today it wasn't too bad, but would we really want to leave it that way? No. Those need to be handled differently. And unless you view it from the top, like we're doing in these pictures, you may not even see it. If you're just viewing those from the distal end, uh, you know, you're looking down this from this direction, you may not even see that. So you have to look at it from that distal, or excuse me, from the top. We talked about the crumbly uh, areas on dystrophic nails. You can see these areas that are all crumbly. You sanded a lot of it off today on these pictures, but within a day or two, all of these are going to crumble more. And how do I know that? I can see white under here. White means there's air under there. There's lots of air under here. A nail isn't typically white. And look under here, this is all white. Air is under it, which means even though today you've sanded it down, it needs to have some more sanding. More of that needs to come off. It is going to crumble on them and starting catching on their socks and scratching them within just a few days. Please think into the future and sand some more. As far as anticipating how those nails will grow out on the distal edge, we were talking just now about how they uh, grow out and crumble some more, but this would be the distal edge. So right now, these don't look bad at all, do they? They're pretty short and nothing's catching, but think about in say a week or two weeks from now. Look at those two areas, okay? Those are kind of overhanging and as, although they're not catching today because they're kind of surrounded by skin, within a couple of weeks, it will be. So those need to be sanded off a little bit more so that it will grow out without problems. The one on the right, that's not catching anything today, but you can tell, remember it's a little whiter. That means there's air under there. And same thing there, there's air under there. So that's not connected to the skin. And in a very short period of time, that's gonna catch on socks. Those need to be clipped off. Same thing over here, that's uh, not a good shape and there's air under it. Anticipating that growth. So we talked about the one, that, first, that second toe there. Look at the third toe. I just did the second little arrow. Today, that's a, a very nice cut, isn't it? It's, it's straight across. That's nice. But the, that little corner and that corner is pretty square. And particularly, this one here is right up against that toe. As that nail on the third toe grows, is, it go, is that corner gonna catch and cause a, a little laceration right here in the second toe? Very possibly. And the one over here, there's no toe right next to it, but is that a sock catcher? I call them sock catchers. So that's why I don't lead, like to leave those corners even on the lesser toes. As it grows out, they are problems. And of course, a little bit more there. Anticipating that might be fine today. They, they did cut it back here on the side real well, probably more, possibly more than they needed to, but maybe there was something going on there that we can't see in this picture. But look what they left here is, is much narrower. So what they really need to do is just sort of round that a little bit more because those little edges that you see, those two little points are a problem in, in weeks to come. Right now, that, uh, the arrow I just put on, on the lateral aspect of the fourth toe, right now that's fine. But you see the skin around it, now you're used to looking at that, is a little swollen and a little purplish. So we, we're afraid there always is a little bit of chronic pressure there. And since that's almost out past the skin now, very shortly, within a week or two, that, that corner is gonna be out and in harm's way. So that needs to be just gently rounded down a little bit. 
The lateral aspect of the of the fifth toe is the ultimate sock catcher and it's a little baby toenail so nobody ever looks at it. That's the one you really do have to trim back. Uh, that's the first sock catcher. Okay, so there again, that's that baby toe. Looks pretty good today, but in very short period of time, that's gonna catch socks for sure. This is not lifted up. Well, it is lifted up, it's white underneath, but from the angle you were looking at it, from the distal area, it probably looked fine, but if you pull the toe down a little bit so you can look from the top, it's obvious that's not gonna work. Um, you, that needs to be cut straighter across and that corner is still digging in over there. So today it's fine, but within a very short period of time, you have two big problems there. Learn to look into the future. I talked before about U-shaped distal edges, and let me tell you what I mean about that. Uh, we'll talk again in a minute about this shape of nail, uh, a mega nail, horseshoe nail. Uh, some people call that a U-nail. That is a U in a specific um, uh, direction. And that is one thing we're talking about in a minute. But right now, we're talking about the, uh, the shape of a U. Oh, yeah, we don't want those. The shape of a U in that plane. So while this nail, for instance, that second toe, is not necessarily uh, an omega nail, this corner and this corner were left too distal. That's what I'm talking about now, is leaving these corners more distal not the overall shape of the nail, but leaving the medial and the lateral borders more distal. Those are, as the nail gonna, grows out, those are gonna catch on everything very quickly, and we caused that. It's very easy to fix. It takes less than a second. Clip, clip, clip. Okay, let's go down there. Clip, clip. That's what I mean. Uh, oh, let's do this one lip. Um, that's what I mean. You have to make that distal edge the same distance distally. I know it's a little hard to visualize. So that those edges don't grow out first. Here's another one. So this is nice and flat against the nail, against the toe. It's all fine except look how much further distal this is. That needs to be trimmed more uh, more uh, closer to being straight across. Same thing here. This looks pretty good today, but there it is. Okay, we can't let that stay like that because in a week, that's a problem. Okay, now I think you're seeing what I'm, what I'm calling a U-shaped nail. So we, we went over some of the goals to make it medically appropriate and to take care of current problems and to anticipate and prevent problems in weeks to come. So you're first going to observe and remove uh, any ingrowing areas. You're going to shorten the nails. You're going to sand or remove other crumbly areas. You're going to gently roll the, uh, around the borders, excuse me, the, the nail borders to prevent it from being ingrown, from scratching during regrowth. You're going to anticipate how the nails grow out over the next few weeks, and you're going to view it from the patient's angle, as well as ask them if you accomplished everything they want you to accomplish. Let's go now, uh, I just mentioned it, the omega-shaped nails, horseshoe nails, inverted, curled, we've all seen these. What do we do with those? Let's talk about some of the nail pathologies we have to address. How do you cut these things? The other thing we're going to talk about are pterygium formations. So let's go into both of those pathologies. With the omega nails, remember that the skin is higher under the central portion of the nail. Now that's true also with the rounded, uh, thick, mycotic nails. That We have to be careful when we're sanding those because we can't make them flat. That's a different video. Look at the sanding video. The, nail, the, the skin humps up under toenails, especially the big toenails. So you have to be aware of that. So even in this thicker nail, uh, the, uh, it grows up under there, the, excuse me, the, the skin. This is what happens when we're sanding and we don't take that into account. We try to sand it flat, but that nail was taller, excuse me, the, the skin was taller underneath. We couldn't make the nail flat, so we hit skin. That's what made that toenail bleed. The to, excuse me, the toenail is not bleeding. I get that all the time. The nail, nails don't bleed. 
we have sanded down trying to make that toenail flat but instead we hit the skin underneath that's humped up under there and the skin is what's bleeding so you have to be careful, especially when you're sanding, but also with these Omega nails when you're cutting them. Okay. What you don't do is treat them like they're a flat nail. You don't just go in there and, and with your clipper and just clip, because to do that, you would have to lift up that edge there, holding it like, like you would if you were cutting this section. You're gonna have to lift this little portion up. Well, it's connected to the skin you can't cut that straight across it would tear the nail on the edge there up away from the skin attachment i see people do that they try to just kind of wiggle that under the, the the clipper under that edge and just hold the nail excuse me the clipper in the same angle and just clip well that hurts because the, the clipping pulls it up off the skin you can't do that you have to take into account the way the nail is growing so here we go. You have to make your hands move so that the angle of the clipper, the angle that you're cutting, is the same as the angle of the nail at that spot. Then you take little two millimeter bites across the nail. What I love to say is, how does a beaver take down a big tree one bite at a time? And that's what you do. So you're going to move your hand to be in the angle that the nail is growing at that second and take two millimeter bites. So bite, 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 bite. It might take eight bites to get across that nail and you're moving your hand, you're not pulling up on the nail. Does that make sense? It doesn't have to be painful. This doesn't hurt them at all. You are not lifting the nail up from its attachment. You're moving your hand and taking a small bite and then going forward a little bit, another small bite, another small bite, another small bite, with you constantly moving the direction of the clipper so that it is always at the same angle as that nail. That's the appropriate way to do those. Same thing when it's just on one side uh, of the nail, it doesn't matter. You're going to always move your clippers to be at the same uh, angle as the nail at that spot. Now, sometimes the nail is totally curled like this one then you you really can't cut it uh it has to be sanded i get that question quite a bit how do i cut that nail you can't because you have no idea where the skin is under there and you're just as likely to cut into the skin really badly so you have to either with a a, a big emery board or preferably of course with a sander that one needs to be sanded and, and any of them that are totally curled you can't cut those they have to be sanded and when they're sanded there's no pain and it can be done really well very quickly. Pterygium, let's talk about that. Uh, if you look that up, you're gonna see pterygium uh, in the, in the uh, eyelid rim. It's a little neurovascular bump there that you, that you see on the, the ridge of your eyelid. It is uh, the same thing here uh, under the toe, a pterygium. It's a neurovascular skin appendage. It's a piece of skin that grows out. It's a little skin growth and it contains nerves and blood vessels. It doesn't hurt the patient. They don't know they have it. You can manipulate it like I'm doing here with the curette. It doesn't matter. That doesn't bother them. But if you cut it, it's like cutting your dog's or your na cat's nail too short. It cuts into a big nerve and a big vessel, not a capillary. The patient literally screams it bleeds a lot and it will bleed for 10 15 minutes it's a really bad experience i like you to be aware that pterygiums exist and how to deal with them it is a bad experience to to do that and as you can tell in this picture there's always a lot of garbage so to speak under a nail and i've already said we don't clean out under there it takes too much time and, it, and the patient hates it it hurts so maybe there's a pterygium under there and i don't even know it i always assume there's a pterygium I always do and use one of the techniques I'm about to tell you uh, to take care of shortening that nail when there might be something under there that I could cut. It can be in any nail. There's that one um, in the, on the what's that the third toe excuse me fourth toe. It is always in the center dead center of the nail. I don't know why and that uh, red arrow I just put up you're seeing the thing that looks kind of like a triangle or like a spike coming out. 
the uh, skin appendage itself, the pterygium, will form a callus type of material, hyperkeratotic tissue on top of it because it's being rubbed all day. That doesn't mean anything, uh, it, and, and I know there's a lot of that kind of hyperkeratotic uh, um, tissue under there, so that's one reason I know it's hard to see sometimes, but that's normal and it doesn't affect anything. There's another picture of one. It's always dead center. Okay. It's a skin appendage. It is not attached to the toenail. It's coming out of skin. So one thing you can do if you are cutting that nail, clipping that nail, is of course don't clip the skin, the pterygium. But it's not attached to the nail. So if you can put your clipper in there and push up uh, uh, this is where you're kind of scraping the clipper in the bottom of the nail as you go around and those little bites you're doing, you're just going to clip a uh, nail. You'll clip over the pterygium. The pterygium is below the nail. It's not part of the nail. It's on the skin. So you can clip above it if you uh, just aim your clipper and kind of scrape along that bottom ridge of the nail as you're cutting. So you can definitely cut that off above the skin appendage. Sanding is the best. Uh, you can sand it all day long. It doesn't hurt at all. If you happen to make it bleed when you're sanding, it's not, you haven't cut the nerve in the blood vessel. Then it's just a scratch like any other sanding scratch. It doesn't hurt at all. So I use my, my sander almost exclusively when I can and then I don't even have to worry. Drigium's under there. Uh, one of the things you'll learn in the sanding video is how to uh, shorten nails with sanding instead of trimming, excuse me, cutting. So that technique is what I use most of the time because then I don't have to care. I can just sand away, that shortens the nail and uh, takes the hyperkeratotic tissue off of the pterygium and no, no pain, no blood, nothing. We just have to worry about it if we're clipping it, if we're trimming it with the clipper. Okay, clipper techniques. We've looked at some pathology that we have to kind of have special techniques for, uh, but sometimes there's just odd angles. How often have you kind of moved around and around the foot and you're trying to get a better angle and you can't move and, and you're, you're kind of squirting your chair around different ways to get an angle to cut some of these nails? It would be much better for you and for the patient if you could just sit still and learn to use your clippers with some techniques that would make this easier. One of the problems that, that foot care nurses get is they get carpal tunnel and they get uh, different problems like that because you're moving your wrist at such odd angles and strange things trying to get these, ang these angles on both the medial and lateral side of the toes. You know, if you're right-handed, it's pretty easy to get the medial side of the toenails trimmed. How do you get the lateral side trimmed? You kind of have to squirrel your arm around and really twist it or you need to move around. That's hard on you, it's hard on your wrist. So typically, this is the way we would hold clippers, just out the, the front, um, a little bit like scissors. And uh, as I said, when you're right-handed, as this person is, on the uh, medial side of the nail, that's no problem. Just clip away. But what about the lateral portion of the nail? Now this person is trying to get the lateral side of that nail. And look, it's kind of squirreled up and the wrist is cocked and trying to get it. Not much control and having to twist the toe a little bit there. See with her hand, she's trying to twist the toe. It's hard to get that angle. So what if... We just change the way you're holding the clipper. In this picture, we're holding it the way I said before, with the, with the, the uh, head of the clipper coming out where your thumb is. In this picture, I've turned it backwards, so to speak. My thumb is up here. So I just turn the clipper backwards in my hand and I'm holding it backwards. And now I have fabulous control of it. Let me show you another picture. Okay, so there's holding it frontward. I just flip it over. And I know my hand slipped over here too. I probably shouldn't have done that, should I? Uh, it's coming out the baby finger side now. So it's no big deal. It's easy to do. You just flip it over in your hand. And there's a picture, you know, using it now with it coming out the baby finger side. 
The other advantage to this too is when you're holding it this way, your two strongest fingers are your thumb and your first finger. Now they're the ones doing the work. When you hold it the other way, up here, your baby finger is doing most of the work because that's what's at the end of the clipper where you're trying to squeeze it. Uh, so that's another advantage of this. It takes better um, advantage of your strongest fingers. And look how much straighter the wrist is there and uh, getting a great angle at this to be very efficient very quickly. Here we go with forward. That nail's really crooked. And here, trying to do it with the, uh, the clipper coming out the, far, the back side, that wrist is fairly straight and it's uh, just so much easier, so much more control. So I want you to practice that. Uh, in class, we practice on, on little plastic grapes. We cut them in half. Uh, and just hold the clipper uh, d two different directions so that we can just uh, practice that. I know it's awkward. But everyone says this is one of the most valuable things you learn in class is how to master this technique. It makes it faster to do. You are less frustrated and tired at the end of the day because you didn't have to struggle so much. And you don't tend to get a tired hand or sore wrist. Medial side of the nail, lateral side of the nail. Both with that clipper coming out of the baby finger side, so backwards. When I'm doing this, and most podiatrists, this is the way we're taught, we rarely use it with it coming out what you might think of as the normal side, coming out toward my thumb. Because all I have to do is, is just flip my hand over then with it coming out of the baby finger side, and I can do both the medial and lateral. It's really um, universal, effective, quick, and I have really good control to get those little corners out. Okay, so... What uh, we've gone over are some of the different uh, instruments that we use for this. We, um, for professional nail care, we've looked at some of the different pathologies we have to be aware of, pterygiums and uh, horseshoe shaped nails, that sort of thing. We've looked at different ways to hold your clippers that make, uh, make your work much more precise and much faster. So what we're gonna do now is look at some videos uh, of the work we do in the classroom there uh, at the hands-on class outside of Seattle, Washington, and uh, watch some of these techniques being used in, um, in real life. So I hope it's helpful. So, how are you doing today? Good, good. First thing I do is look between the toes to make sure there's no... Well, you took uh, a shower. I hope it... <laughs> it's fine. I don't I'm going to do just this foot because that way you don't have to go back and forth. Um, I'm looking for white areas or infections or anything like that, and it's fine. And the skin is good. He's very ticklish. But his nails are long. He has different kind of nails. These nails are pretty uh, uh, thin, so we don't have too much trouble with them. So I'm just going to stabilize the toe and take little baby bites. That way I'm controlling it and I know what's underneath it because sometimes there are pterygiums or things underneath. I turn the clipper backwards in my hand sometimes to get these other angles and that way I don't have to move around the patient. I can just sit right here and I can get my corners as well. So it doesn't matter whether you start on the end of the nail or in the middle of the nail, it's more the angles involved. And I'm going to do these edges. On the lesser nails we don't have to go way down but this is a sock catcher. So today that's okay, but in about a week even, that's going to be grown out enough that it catches his socks or the sheets or something, so we're not going way down. We're just rounding it just a little bit so that it's not a sock catcher, and they can go further into the uh, a month or two months without problems. So, Russ, so he's an easy guy. And again, I turned it backwards in my hand. From his angle, I see that I just left that kind of pointed. 
So you have to look from the other angles as well, because that I can't leave pointed, because again, as that grows out, you have to think into the future. As that grows out, that is going to catch things. So I just want to even that up a little bit more, so it's not pointed there at the end. This is an example of a nail that's really not growing at all. It it's, might be growing a little taller, but that happens with nails sometimes. So I just want to get it out these little borders a little bit because it is pressing in there and I'm kind of using my clipper to pull it out a little bit. Okay, that one doesn't need it. I'm going to get a different instrument, this curette. They don't like the curette, so you use it sparingly. But with this, I can sort of scoop all of that debris out. And the debris is keratin that in the normal course of things has sloughed off, but it gets caught under there. So now you can see there's room down there and it's not going to have that pressure or any risk. Sorry. There we go. So there's really not much else we need to do to that. I just needed to clean it up a little bit. So this one, just because of the angles, I'm going to start in the middle of the nail. It doesn't matter. I'm putting my finger over at the last minute just so the nail doesn't fly. That's all that is. In this angle, in this corner though, it dives under the skin. It, he has a nail that's very curved. So I have to make my little baby bites. You can't just take one big bite because that would lift this up and it would hurt him. So you saw me take little bites. And now that I'm in the corner, I'm just real carefully, again, going down the side just a little bit so we don't have that little spike catching his socks in a way. So you can see it's uh, a nice flow, and I'll, sh I'll demonstrate that in a minute. A nice flow means uh, curved down, so it's not going to get caught growing out. I'm holding the clipper backwards again because it allows me to get this great angle and do this very precisely. And I'm just going, wiggling under there to get that little edge off so I don't cut them straight across. I know that's the conventional wisdom, but again, I want this to last for two or three months. So if I go down just a little bit, and then I'm going to maybe just make this a little shorter. I'm going to look on top to make sure it's a pretty good angle. I'm going to take my curette just to make sure that that's a nice, that there's not a, a spot here that's a, a pokey part that's going to get grown in. And I'm really not happy with that. Right there, there actually is more of a, of an ang of a, of a little ledge than I want there to be. That could cause him problem later, so I just want to make that a little bit rounder going down. Just whoop. Sometimes I have to come from on top because I can't get under. There we go. See, it was that easy. Let's look at this one now, make sure, because that's the way that they get ingrown, is if we cut it down a little bit, but we don't go all the way to the edge of the nail. Look, so that's just some keratin coming out. It's just the sloughed off skin that gets caught in there. And so I'm making sure that right there, that's not something that I'm leaving that's going to, there we go. That's not nail, that's just more keratin. But for me to get that out is awesome because I'm going to use my clipper just more as a force up to kind of get that out. Oh, if, it, if you can't pull it easily, don't pull. So now, there, I had to go down and clip it off. Because if I had pulled that, it might have made it bleed. So it was just keratin, but somehow it was attached. So now I'm carefully, don't overdo it with the curette, they don't like it. But I'm making sure it's cleaned out in there and that there's nothing that's going to catch and make it ingrown as it grows out. And there's not. All right, let's look at some others. This is an example of just taking little bites going across and see I'm moving my hand in the same direction the nail is slanted. You don't just clip straight across in that plane. You have to move with the arch of the nail. That way it doesn't pull up off the skin and hurt them. There we go. See, I'm moving my hand. That's why it kind of gets in the way of the camera. And by the way, I just put my finger over that as the, at the last minute right before I clip so the little piece doesn't fly. That's all I'm doing when I put my finger there like that. Going back and getting a little bit more off that one. Sometimes I go a little bit at a time so I can tell what's under there. This was a little trauma it looks like the patient had with such long nails, so we're going to just kind of clean that up a little bit for now and come back later. There we go, cutting across, little bites, little bites. 
getting that corner off now we don't want that to be a sock catcher you have to think two weeks in advance where is that corner going to be in two weeks so we don't need to cut the corners on the lesser nails as far back as we do on the great nail um, we just have to keep it from catching the sock in a couple of weeks now this nail is not particularly thick but it's really hard so I'm struggling with this it is hard and it's not a matter of I need sharper clippers I need to take smaller bites as I go and I kind of need to just work on it like an art project back and forth a little bit get that little piece off that I cut get it out of my way and so this isn't pretty this is taking me a while to get the different pieces I got to turn that backwards on my hand now that's a better angle I wasn't getting a good angle coming from the side so I moved the clipper to come from the top now I move the clipper back in my hand to where it's going across again and now I'm cutting forward um, I, I'm smoothing that with the sander you can't leave it like that and this particular video is more about cutting but I just wanted to show you that sometimes you just can't do it all with the clipper so I'm coming back I'm smoothing those edges and I'm smoothing that top so that it's a little bit better than it was with such a hard nail cutting a little more off this one I'd cut it before but I like to get all the white off I want to buy them as much time as possible before they have to come back to see me unless I specifically ask that they want it longer going down in the side there see I had to turn the clipper backwards again to get a better angle looks like I'm going back to the uh, the corner on the big toe the corners are so important that's what can uh, rub against and scrape the the adjacent toe it can catch on the socks and in bed at night sometimes they rub it on the additional leg okay here I go down the corner of this big nail little bites little bites headed in the direction sorry my hands in the way it's hard to, to do this in a way to film it so you can see I got that all the way down there there's still some white in there so I'm going to use the sander again to kind of shorten it a little more to smooth it so I can tell what's left and sometimes I can get the rest of it out this way and make it uh, um, uh, uh, smooth, excuse me, smooth enough where it's not going to cause any problem so it's a joint effort between the clipper and the sander Okay, different nail watch this now I tried to grab too much and I couldn't do it so I had to go back and we're gonna look at it in a second it's not that the instrument is needs to be sharpened it's that you're trying to grab too much let's look at that again little bite and now I'm trying to take too much on the next bite and I can't so I have to go back then I can take it that's a big deal okay this is a different nail obviously we've just done a lot of sanding on it you'll see that in a different video it was huge and now we have it down to as thin as we can get it remember we can't get it flat because the skin underneath is humped up too so that is a, a thin nail on kind of a humped up skin underneath so I'm going to use the clipper to go in and take some of this uh, debris and the pressure out of the side this might look brutal but the patient it doesn't hurt I'm not hurting them at all um, they will tell you that if you haven't already experienced that I'm using this almost like a force up in a way to kind of grab pieces down there so I'm cutting a little bit but I'm also grabbing some of the debris and that debris might be callus material it might be um, keratin that brushes off but gets caught down there in that little valley it can't brush off like it does on the rest of our skin so all that keratin that is cycled over the 28 days just gets stuck down there so in a way I'm kind of pulling that up out of there this isn't the best angle to do this other side but again I'm kind of limited because I'm trying to make my hand so you can still see what I'm doing this is not the best angle but I'm still going to get it done normally I would come from the top from the distal end but you can see I'm carefully clipping a little nail and getting some of that debris that keratin and callus material out of there now I can't get it all so what I'm going to do is come back with the sander this is what I call a skinny burr it's a diamond burr that's a particular shape uh, again this video is not about the the sanding but I want to show you that when I can't get it all out of the corner with the clipper there are other methods so I love this skinny diamond burr it affects the nail more than it does the skin so I can kind of put it way down there and while I can certainly scrape the skin it's I, it's hard to I can press it against the nail as you see me doing and get that corner out of there and that side and it just works really really well and again it doesn't hurt them 
it looks like I'm I'm kind of pushing hard, but it, it's not, and you will see that. Get those corners out of there. Isn't that awesome? And that little valley will just close up. I mean, it pushes back up. The skin is just pushed down from the pressure. Now I'm, I'm letting the skin cool down before I do some more, so I'm just kind of getting some of that other debris off. Now I'm going to go back down. See, I let it cool off because it does build up heat. Get that out of there. Smooth and wonderful. I love the skinny diamond burr. Look what a great job that did. That is fantastic. Between the major uh, sanding, then the clipping, and then the skinny burr on the side. I'm going to finish up just a little bit there with the curette uh, just to make sure I got the edges the way they need to be. You can't over, shouldn't overuse this. The patients don't like it. This hurts them. The sanding and everything typically does not hurt them, but they do not like the curette. Uh, the Canadian foot care nurses use what's called a, a, a Blacks file, which works a little bit better, uh, and, and they tolerate it a little bit more. It's more of a little rasp, so that's a good tool, too, or instrument, rather. All right. Now it's all the debris is out, and it's done, and there's your final process. And it was huge before. I should have put in a before and after picture of it. That is a fantastic review. Let's go back to the clipper. I'm going to use it to get the corners out of the lesser nails now. Get the same debris out, the keratin and some callus material out of each side. Just not as much. Don't have to worry as much. Here I'm coming down almost from on top of the nail. I'm trying to get not the nail any thinner or, or more slanted, but that's a big old callus right there. See how soft it is? That's a callus. It's common to build up a callus in the borders of nails, so I need to get that out also because of the pressure. It looks like I'm tearing it. I, I swear I'm not. I'm cutting it. Don't ever pull anything. You could tear it and cause bleeding. So I kind of had the bulk bit out. I'm going to come back with that skinny burr again later and get that smoothed out. So it's a multi-step process sometimes. But this is teaching you how to use the clipper to get some of that debris out. This isn't me, now it's one of the student nurse, or not, she's not a student nurse, one of the nurses who is in the class, and so a little more tentative with it, but I wanted to show you this, what, what she's learning uh, on this day. So she's taking those little bites out to go across, she's checking it, <laughs> she's doing a great job. And the baby toe, she tried to get too much, oh, it worked for her, okay, it kind of cracked across, you have to get those baby toes. Now look, look at her get that corner, nice, getting that corner out of there. She's doing a great job. There we go. Clip it off. Now she left a little, that little piece, she, she cut it on a little bit different level. And she'll come back with the sander. There she goes getting that corner off. I love it when she gets the corner off. And she'll come back with the sander on all this. This isn't finished. This is just the first pass. Same thing. She's just cutting across little baby bites. As you can see, she's moving her clipper in the same arc that the nail grows. Get that little border out of there and she'll come back and get the other uh, side, the lateral side borders too. She's just on this direction so she's getting this right now. There we go and she'll come back with the sander. Okay, on the big toe, little bites, little bites, kind of cr cracked off and that's that's just fine. Get that off of there. Again, she knows she's going to come back with the uh, sander, but she's trying to get it as even as possible with this. This whole thing only took her about five minutes. You know, you're, you're seeing it kind of in real time. So this doesn't take an hour to do this. She's getting the corner down there in that toe. Look at that. Great job. She's making sure that she got it. She'll come back and check it later with the curette and the sander. Get, now she's going back for those lateral borders. Remember, she'd gotten the medial borders before. Now her hand, her hand is holding the instrument in a way that gets these, these lateral borders better. So she's definitely clipping down the borders on both sides of the lesser toes also. We don't want that to catch the socks in a couple of weeks. Today it might be fine, but you have to know where it's going to grow in a couple of weeks. There she is getting the lateral border of that nail. She's being real careful. It's usually just one clip like that. See, she left it there. She doesn't want to pull. She knows not to pull. So she's going to come back a little bit in the sander. So she's gone to the other foot. Same patient, other foot. So that was maybe five minutes to, to do all the clipping on that first foot. She's going across on this one now. 
again, you saw her move her hand. It got in the way of the camera because she was moving it so that uh, she went in the same arc that the nail does, so she doesn't pull it up off the skin. She's getting her corner. She's just doing a great job. She's going to move on to lesser toes because she knows she's going to come back and thin those a little bit and do some more with the sander. So again, she's moving her hand. Sorry it's in the way of the camera, but that's what she has to do to make her cut on the same uh, shape uh, arc that the nail grows in. Look at that. She took that big old grown out nail off. It's nice and thick. It almost is growing vertically, but she's cutting it off beautifully. Moving her hand again to be in the same shape or the same arc as the nail grows. Nice work. So there it is. Now she's, uh, oh sorry, she's going to do some more corners there. Oh, this is a good corner. Watch her do that. Nice. I love it when she gets the corner like that. She's checking the corners on this one, the medial borders. And uh, she, uh, getting all of them one at a time. Just takes one clip and then she's safe. Otherwise, look at that would have caught in the socks real soon. Look at that thing sticking up there if she left that. She's having a little bit of a struggle getting the right angle, but uh, she got it. Now that's a little further down than she needed to go, and she kind of stopped. She realized that, and she's going to come back with her sander. So it's not that she's quitting on that. She knew that went a little too far. It's going to be fine. It didn't bleed, but she's going to come back with the sander and smooth that and make it uh, a finished product and say here, she's getting that down there really nice. She's checking it with her finger, and now she's going to come back with the sander, like I said. We're not going to watch all of this because this is about the clipper, but I just wanted to show you following through on it. All right. Well, hopefully this was helpful in letting you see how we get this done. I hope to see you at class. Take care.